Welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. And this segment of Student of the Gun Radio is brought to you by Mr. Microphone from Ronco, the perfect Christmas gift. No, we're kidding. We don't have Mr. Microphones. We have black carbon steel microphones. And we are proud to be behind the black carbon steel microphones today to be with you and to be spreading the good news and cheer that we do all week long. Now, Jared is on the other side of the board over there, and he's uh, working the uh, working the dials and the knobs and the levers. Jared, how are you doing today on this? Actually, it's a beautiful day in southern Mississippi. It is. I am doing very well. It's it's like you said, it's a very beautiful day. Um, I'm I'm kind of down a little bit because uh, today's Don's his his wedding is today. Oh, hey, congratulations to our good friend Don Pierce, who is getting married today as we're recording this. Yeah, he's one of my best friends from high school. He's getting married today. It's making me feel old. My friends are getting married and having kids. and Yeah, getting well, having kids will age you for sure. It definitely will age you. Now, folks, we've got a lot to talk about this week, so we're going to jump right into it. But before we jump right into it, we want to thank our, our genuine sponsors. Unfortunately, Ronco is not one of our sponsors, but you know who is? Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida, Colt Manufacturing, the makers of the LE901 rifle, and, of course, Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. And we're going to go up and visit our friends in Cross, at uh, Crossbreed here uh, next month in May. We're going to see them up in uh, Missouri. So we want to thank them. Now, folks, we've got uh, we've got our excess good guy of the week coming up, and this is a this is very pertinent. If, if you guys are out there and you're looking for ways to save money or to practice or to train, get some some practice in effectively while saving money at the same time, you want to perk up your ears. Jared, tell us who our good guy of the week is, and tell us what their question was. Uh, before I mention the question, I'm just going to say, if you win the Good guy of the week. I need you to email me. That's Jared J A R R A D at studentofthegun dot com. Email me your address, shirt size, and phone number. And this week's student of the week is Cole, and he posted his question to the forum. He or she, I'm not sure which one it would be. I think C O L E is a man. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's no women named C O L E. I, I I know a couple. You do really? Yeah. Well, actually, it's short for Nicole. Ah, yeah, so yeah, I got you. I, got I don't you. know the nickname. It could be a nickname on the forum. But anyway, go to forums.studentofthegun.com, and you can post your question there to get picked for the, the good guy of the week. Uh, Cole says, is it a good idea to wait until after receiving professional training to begin dry fire practice regimen? I don't want to instill bad habits, and I'm saving towards some professional training, but that's still a little ways off. If dry practice at this stage is a bad idea, what can I do in the meantime? Yeah, that that uh, your question right there is actually it's one of the reasons that many professional instructors uh, will, I guess, bad mouth or, or uh, dry fire. And what dry fire is, is essentially it's practicing without live ammunition and or what people call dry practice. And when you dry fire or dry practice, you're just teaching yourself to work the mechanics of the machine. Uh, whether it's the work in the slide or what have you, and specifically dealing with trigger management and being able to manipulate the trigger without disturbing the sights. And that is the big deal. Uh, That is what you're striving for with handguns, is the ability to hold the sights still, specifically the front sight, while at the same time putting muscle tension onto the gun and making the trigger, you know, release, releasing the trigger, making it go bang. Only when you're dry firing, there's no bang. So it's kind of a, you know, when you ask that question, I have to say, if you've never had any training, then maybe the answer is no, or it, it unless you've had some type of guidance. Because what people will do is they think that they're dry firing. They get out in their backyard or in their basement or their den or whatever, and they unload their gun, they put all the ammunition away, and they pull out their gun and they just start pulling the trigger, click, 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 and they think that that is dry practice. Well, that's not dry practice at all. What that is is that's teaching yourself how to snap the trigger, and that's not a good thing, as our as Cole pointed out there. Now, Jared, Jared mentioned to me when we were doing the the pre show um, that there was something that we had already made available to you guys, the students of the gun, that deals with dry practice. Jared, what's that? 
if you guys are not signed up for the newsletter, go to suitinthegun.com and as a as a byproduct of signing up, you get entered for the giveaways, obviously, but you also get exclusive training material. And we did an entire training video on dry fire specifically. So dry fire, you can learn from from watching. Um, I, I mean, you would say that, right? Yeah. And you can learn it from the video. Uh, it's there's a couple of pointers that we give you, and then you can do it correctly just from watching the video, and and that won't instill bad habits into your uh, training regimen. Yeah, something that uh, you, you need to, uh, I think a lot of people are really are missing out on, is the fact that we've produced a tremendous amount of training material, of tips and tactics and so forth, that you can access, and all you have to do is go to studentofthegun.com, sign up for the newsletter. You get the the one-box workout free report. You can print it out, take it with you to the range, use that as a one-box workout. And then you get immediate access to training videos that only you as a subscriber get to see. You know, they're hidden uh, until you sign up, and then you get the links and you get to watch them. So that's something that you really should, I mean, it's it's free. Why not take advantage of it? Uh, at very least, you can take that little tidbit and put it in your toolbox. Now, I will tell you this. The best way to dry practice, if you're uh, a novice, if you haven't had uh, professional training, well, one of the best ways is to actually work uh, in pairs, work with a partner. Let, let's give, tell the audience what professional training is because there's a lot of myths. Okay, professional training. Yeah, when we say professional training, uh, we're talking about actually spending some money and paying a person who is a, we'll say, you know, an expert in the uh, in the field. Uh, people that actually make their living as trainers, uh, and and not just when I say make their living, what I would say to you is if the person who wants to charge you to train with them. If that's not necessarily how they make their living, if they just do it once in a while, they may be able to give you a little bit of assistance. But think about it like this. If you were going to hire a uh, an electrician to completely rewire your house, would you hire a guy that does it every once in a while? Uh, and, you know, he did one last year and one but the year before. Or would you hire somebody that does that all the time? Would you trust their work over somebody that, well, I know how to put wires in, so I'll cut you a really good deal and I'll put them in. Hey, it's up to you. You can do whatever you want. Uh, same thing with a mechanic. You know, Would you hire a mechanic to uh, rebuild an engine who did it once in shop class or a guy that does it all the time whose job it is to do that? So when you're seeking professional instruction, uh, just you know, vet the school, vet the company, and, and find out if does that person do that for a living, or do they just do it as a hobby? Do you have anything else to say on that point, Jared? I was sh- give uh, give them some schools that you would recommend. Okay, schools that I would recommend, uh, I would definitely recommend uh, the TDI Tactical Defense Institute up in Ohio. That's in Southern Ohio. So if you live in Kentucky, it's only a couple hours away from you, probably. Uh, Tactical Response in Camden, Tennessee. If you live in Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Louis, you know Louisville uh, area up there in Kentucky, uh, it's it's a one day drive. It's easy to get to. Out west, you might want to check out the ITTS and that Scotty Reeds School out there, International Tactical Training Schools, or uh, in obviously in Arizona, you can check out Gunsight Training Academy. Now. With with Student of the Gun, if you guys go to the website, you can see that, uh, or you will see if you go there, that we do have lots of training material available. We have the Armed Living DVD. We've got the Student of the Gun book, and we've got the other books. Let me see. Can I, can I reach over there and grab it? Is that okay? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. He, while he's reaching very far. and it, well, We're doing something new. Yeah, um, if you haven't figured it out yet by now, we've got the cameras turned on for this. Yeah, we're we're doing something new for you guys. We're uh, doing a video version of the the radio show, and we're gonna I'm gonna figure out how to distribute that, but uh, we'll let you know. It, for now, it's gonna go up on on our uh, Student of the Gun SOTG Homeroom YouTube. Is that the name? Wherever you want to put it, buddy. On SOTG Homeroom. Is that the name on YouTube? Yeah. SOTG Homeroom. Uh, search that, and there's there's a wealth of knowledge already on there. Uh, we kind of took a, a hiatus from that for a little while to focus on the more important things, but we're back. All right. Well, the last two educational things that we worked on, and we put I actually put a lot of effort into it uh, during the last year, myself and, and two other authors, 
We are authored the Armed and Smart, A Beginner's Guide to Concealed Carry. This is for those thousands of people who are like, oh, I have a, uh, you know, I've got, here you go. Show the camera, Paul. Paul, Jared's giving, Jared's on the other side and he's giving me the wave. He's like, hold it up for the camera. Okay. So I did that and uh, those are available. We've got a link up on the Student of the Gun website and then I have Armed and Smarter. And that, again, is the follow-up to the original book. But anyway, there's a lot of material out there for you guys. And when it comes to dry fire practice, uh, we think that you need to understand what you're doing. It, just pointing a gun at, at a blank wall and snapping the trigger is not dry fire practice. Uh, you want to go ahead and get a little bit of education or a little bit of instruction before you start doing that. Because well, as Cole said, what you could be doing is just ingraining bad habits. Now let's go ahead and move on to the meat of this particular segment. Yeah, I never thought in a million years that Flavor Flav and I would agree on anything, but I'm going to have to uh, go ahead and say that I, I agree with him on this one point. 911 is a joke, but it's not a funny joke. And the reason we decided to talk about this this week is, uh, as many of you may have seen uh, on your national news, there was another, just another story and where a woman called 911 to say that she thought her husband had lost his mind and was threatening her. She was scared, all this. Stayed on 911 for 13 minutes. And the reason that people outside of Denver actually heard about this story was because the 911 call ended with a gunshot with her husband shooting her through the head and murdering her. And this story got picked up by Fox and uh, NBC News and CNN and so forth. And everyone was, you know, what people, what they took away from this is, see, it's the Denver PD's fault for not being there fast enough, or the 911 system is a failure, or what are we going to do and how are we going to examine this? But as you guys know, as, as educated students of the gun, we've already talked about this situation. Uh, several uh, several months ago, we had a situation that we talked about very heavily on the show that it regard a woman in Oregon who called 911 to say that her crazy ex-boyfriend was beating on her door and trying to get into her house. And the uh, 911 dispatcher told her, basically, uh, we don't have anybody available to send to you, help you, and why don't you ask him to leave? And, you know, obviously that's that's crazy talk, but it happened. And in that situation, the woman, fortunately, was not murdered. But the guy did end up breaking into the house. And he beat her and he sexually assaulted her. And then eventually authorities were able to get there. I, I think it was, it was greater than 45 minutes, wasn't it, Jared? It was like 45 minutes or an hour or something before any emergency people were able to get to that in, that, in Oregon. Does, oh yeah, I yeah. remember that. Yeah, That's it was the, an insane the, amount ask, of time. Yeah, ask your uh, ask the rapist to leave, and uh, we pointed out at that time. And we're going to go ahead and reinforce it now because apparently, well, not apparently, people in America are super slow learners. And when the nine one one system came about, and actually, I did an article uh, this week for the Blaze, and it's already been published on theblaze dot com. You can check that out if you feel like it later. But essentially, I did some research into the 911 program, and I didn't realize that the concept of 911 actually went all the way back to 1968. And uh, it, there was a town in Alabama that originally decided they were going to test the 911 system. Now, naturally, it you know it took a couple of decades before that to catch on, but in order to roll out the 911 centralized emergency system nationwide, all these different communities all over the United States of America had to basically start from scratch. They had to build something new where you used to have, you, know, you had your fire phone number that rang at the fire department and your police number that rang at the police department and your emergency ambulance service that might've rung at the hospital or maybe it rang at the fire department or whatever. Instead of having that all spread out, they decided that they were going to need to consolidate all that, hire humans, hire people to man the phone lines 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, obviously, in order to do something like that, they needed money. They needed tax money. And uh, this, is, this is before the current era of we're just going to go ahead and take your money and you can, you know, sit and spin. 
where we actually had these things called tax levies, where they went to the citizens and they asked the citizens to vote. I know you're thinking, what? They actually asked the citizens to vote for the tax levy? They didn't just do it without their permission? I know, it's kind of crazy, huh? Well, in order to convince the citizens who have never had a 911 system, and this is something that's brand new to them, in order to convince them to vote themselves a tax increase, what they had to do is they had to do a campaign, well, and, or multiple campaigns. And and uh, I recall, you know, back in the uh, the real the early 1990s, like 91, 92 time frame, when I was living in, in Ohio, the uh, essentially you had your firefighters and your your EMTs, your volunteer EMTs and paramedics, and then a lot of the sheriff's reserve officers would go to public events, they'd go to the county fair, they'd do drives and to raise awareness and campaign for the 911 levy, you know, whatever it was, Proposition 27 or, or what have you. So that, in, you know, in November, people would go to the polls and vote for this, whatever it was, a half a percent sales tax increase or something. So I think uh, back then, they in my area, they wanted to raise around $300,000 to implement the new program. Well, why do I why do I say this? Why are we spending the time? Well, what they had to do in order to convince you, the taxpayer, to vote for a tax increase is they had to sell it. They had to sell 911 as what? Well, they had to sell it basically as a as a new miracle cure for every emergency. Whether it's fire, medical emergency, police emergency, what have you. Help is minutes away, three simple digits, dial 911, and help is on the way. It's going to be there, bam. And, you know, they portray you as it's going to reduce, you know, wait times. It's going to increase proficiency. uh, It's going to, you know, and it's going to reduce the total response time, all this jazz. They sell this to the citizens. And, of course, everybody out there is like, well, that, yeah, I mean, I like the idea of being able to call on, you know, three digits and, police or firefighters or EMTs just show up, bam, immediately to my house. I like that idea. So they voted for it. And, you know, 20 some years later now, what we've got, instead of people understanding that 911 was supposed to be a simplified system to reach emergency services and get them rolling in your direction, instead of realizing that, people just view 911 as the cure all well and and why is that is that because they're be the um representatives or people that they are supposed to look up to or get information from is that because they're pushing it as that well i tell you what we're gonna do well yeah and, and so in addition to so you, you have the natural human tendency to be lazy let's face it if if someone tells you hey if you give me a little bit of money, I'll take care of all your problems for you. Then most people, the vast majority of people in the United States will say, okay, I'll give you a little bit of money and you take care of all my problems for me. Great. Fantastic. Well, <laughs> folks, let's face it. There is no free lunch. I learned that many, many years ago. There is no such thing as a free lunch in America. And and when I say free lunch, it's <laughs> – I know you kids you know, are probably thinking, what is he talking about, free lunch? Do you mean we get free food? No. No, Jared. It's, I'm not talking about free food. And he's over I was I was getting excited. <laughs> he, he, hides his, he, he hides his food from me so I don't eat it and I can't I, – I, I must be slacking because I can't find it anymore. Well – when when uh, the term no such thing as a free lunch means that you whatever you get in life you have to pay for or at least at some but someone has to pay for it and what we've got with the 911 system is we have a whole probably two generations of people of citizens now that have decided that when it comes to saving their own lives when it comes to self-preservation to their own safety and security They've essentially punted to the big 911 system. You know, why do I need to learn CPR? You know, I'm going to waste all this time learning CPR when all I have to do is dial 911 on my phone 
and there'll be a professional here within five minutes to take care of you know the problem. So why even bother? Why keep a, a fire extinguisher at home? Why keep a first aid kit? Why learn first aid? Why learn traumatic first aid? This is America, Paul. All I have to do is call on the phone. Somebody doesn't come. Why should I spend that time and put myself in a uh, you know a position where I might be uh, I could be sued when all I have to do is make a phone call? And the same thing goes with firearms and safety against violent threats. So you've got people that want to be convinced, on one hand, they want to be convinced that there is a miracle cure for all that ails you, and it's 911. Well, playing upon that are politicians. We have uh, very deceitful, self-serving politicians that would tell you, hey, peasant, you don't need a gun. You shouldn't want to have a gun. Why would you want to have a gun when all you have to do is pick up your phone and dial three numbers and a professional gun carrier will come to your house or come to wherever you are in the world and take care of you? Well, what did we just see and what have we seen? We've seen examples of where that doesn't work. Now, all of you guys out there, you slick students of the gun, if you're hearing my voice right now and you know what I'm talking about, you're probably jumping around in your seats. You're all like, oh, 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 I know what he, where he's going. I know who he's going to talk about. There is one. I mean, there's been many examples of politicians who have given, you know, anti-gun speeches or gun control speeches or reasonable gun control speeches where, you know, you're not a police officer and you need to rely on the professionals and so forth. But there's one example that we've got for you guys. And it's so glaring of an example that we have to remind you. Now, you guys remember Double D, right? What's Double D for? You got Diana to get Double D for a double dose of stupid. That's right. And during, and I'll set this clip up for you guys, uh, during uh, the Colorado uh, um, recent, the recent spate of uh, civilian disarmament when they were, uh, in the midst of disarming the citizens, several citizens, thousands of citizens came out in public and they went to these public forums and they, and they said, no, we're not for being disarmed. We don't think you should be restricting our ability to protect ourselves. And one elderly gentleman, a, a senior citizen, got up at a public forum where U.S. House Representative Diana DeGette was present. And he expressed his concerns about being an el an older person, an older gentleman, and having to deal with more than one attacker and how these gun control b uh, bills were going to put him at a disadvantage. And this is what she said to him. Good news for you. You live in Denver. The DPD would be there within minutes. You'd probably be dead anyway. So. You'd probably be dead anyway. So. You'd probably be dead anyway. So. All right, I hope that repetition kind of drives the point home. And now let's see what Dad has to say about that. Well, first of all, has anyone else picked up on the just the supreme irony of this situation? You've got anti-gun politician Diana DeGette telling someone who lives in Denver, Colorado, well, the good news is you live in Denver. A DPD will be there within minutes. And if you've never watched this video, folks, you need to do yourself a favor and watch it because I, I, you, can, you get the smugness in the tone of her voice, but when you see her face as she, as she basically mocks this senior citizen, it, it, it will incense you. So the good news is you live in Denver, and DPD will be there within minutes. And then after pausing for the sarcastic laughter, she smugly turns back to the microphone and says, you'll probably be dead anyway. Folks, do you remember this? It's been actually about one year exactly, hasn't it, Jared? Yeah, it's been a little while. Because this goes back to like uh, Student of the Gun Radio episode six or something. So it's been basically one year since this happened. And... I, I hope you, if you're, if you're in Denver, if you're in that district, if you're not a tax slave uh, or a welfare slave, I hope that you remember that when it comes time to, uh, to decide whether or not to send Diana to get back to the house uh, to reelect her, that she, thinks it's, that she thinks your concerns for your safety and welfare are funny and that you'll probably be dead anyway. So who cares? Well, technically, she said minutes 
and they were there within minutes, just several. Oh yeah, minutes. I guess I, so. We could, uh, yeah, we could cut her. So how many minutes? Is 10, that 15, is that up 20, to 30, 65 minutes, 70, you know, an hour, you know, 60 minutes is an hour. So she's not technically a liar, you know, so she says within minutes, maybe they should have asked her to clarify. But if you watch the video, there was no clarification. They just mocked the gentleman, laughed at him and then moved on to the next subject. That's nice. That's that's a nice representative republic we have there. So, folks, well, Paul, what do you suggest? Well, I'll tell you what I suggest. Number one. 911 is there so that you can reach out for help and assistance, and hopefully that assistance will start moving towards your location, wherever you happen to be. But what you do, what steps you take between the time you call 911, you know, call the cavalry, and the time the cavalry actually arrives to where you are could literally mean the difference between life and death. And we're talking about fires, we're talking about medical emergencies, we're talking about violent physical attacks. It does you little good to call the police, have them arrive in five minutes, which is a fast response time, if a home invader can break down your door, get to your bedroom, and kill you in 45 seconds. It doesn't do you any good for the police to be there in five minutes if you can be murdered in 30 seconds. What you do between the time you place that call, or I, we've talked about this before, but I'll mention it again. You're in a rollover car crash. You're uh, someone in your car, or you, has a partially amputated arm. You know, your brachial artery has been ruptured, and you're pumping out bright red blood. You call 911. They're going to be there in five minutes. Fantastic. Jared. Can you bleed from your brachial artery uncontrolled for five minutes and live? No. No. What What's the exact percentage of blood loss? Do you... uh, well, anything it, once you once you get greater than a forty percent blood loss, you reach irreversible shock. Um, and now every every human being has a different volume of blood, but uh, once you get to a certain level of, of blood, you go into irreversible shock, and it doesn't matter how much whole blood they pump into your body, your organs are dying. So the whole it doesn't do you any good to just dial 911 and hide or dial 911 and sit down and wait. You've got to be able to do something for yourself. And the sick, insidious joke of 911 is you have people in the system, people that are supposed to be your representatives and your leaders, that instead of telling you, hey, look, you need to start taking care of business while we're on our way. Instead of telling you that, they want you to be a helpless victim. And do you want to be a helpless victim? You can. You can make the choice to be a helpless victim, or you can make the choice to prepare yourself and understand that 911 is not a cure-all. It never was designed to be. Whether or not it was sold to you that way or not, it was never designed to be a perfect cure-all. So... Next time, uh, next time a politician, next time in your area where a politician, anti-gun politician gets up and uh, gives a speech and tells you, you're not a police officer, you don't need to have those kinds of guns, or you don't need to carry a gun, or you don't need to own a gun, that you should just dial 911 and let the professionals handle it. Say, uh, how do the professionals handle it in Denver? Oh, yeah, you're not supposed to know that, peasant, but you know it because you're an educated student of the gun. All right, let's move on to this next topic. And this next topic is kind of, it's another slice of irony for us. Now, how many of you, oh, I'm sure a lot of you are, especially if you ever stand in line at the grocery store or Walmart or wherever, and those magazines, the the, the mind-numbingly stupid magazines that they put at the checkout there, uh, if, if you've ever done that, you probably saw a picture of J.C. Dugard and this was a couple of years ago on the covers of these magazines. This was a little girl that got, that got, uh, she got kidnapped and held captive for 18 years before they were, they found her and they rescued her. Now, why are we bringing that up? Cause it's not a, really a gun thing. Well, one of the police officers, a female police officer who was involved in the rescue of JC Dugard, she was injured, uh, in the line of duty and she actually had to take a, uh, an early retirement, and she was she was medically retired, 
And so after she became medically retired, she was a UC Berkeley police officer. Well, after she suffered an on-duty injury in 2010, she accepted a disability retirement. Okay, great. Well, this woman, this police woman, was a certified police officer, and she was involved in the J.C. Dugard situation. Well, now that she's retired, she wants to be able to lawfully carry a firearm in California, in the People's Republic of California. But guess what? They told her no. When she originally attempted to get a concealed carry or a waiver permit to carry a concealed weapon, they're like, uh, no. <laughs> like, what? So uh, she, this title of the story from Fox News is, News is Cop Who Helped Rescue J.C. Dugard Sues for the Right to Carry a Concealed Weapon. So here we have the People's Republic of California. You have an honorably retired police officer. We're not talking about a police officer who got busted for, you know, stealing dope money or something and sent to jail. We're talking about one that's that was legitimately an honorably retired police officer. And she wants to get a concealed carry permit so she can protect herself. What kind of crazy stuff is that? This person actually wants to protect themselves. And the initial reaction from the commissar from the uh, People's Republic is, no, no. And, and they cited some obscure, some obscure statute. They're like, well, your type of medical retirement is not the same as a normal retirement, so you don't automatically get one or something. Come on, people. Really? Really? If you still think that, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know, California, really? So a police officer, an honorably retired police officer, has to sue the state for permission to carry a concealed weapon. And I know a lot of you guys out there in California are like, good. It stinks for us. We have to beg permission from the commissar to carry a gun. Why should you be any different? And I'm with you. I understand that. But that's the mentality that you're dealing with out there. Jared, how are we doing on time over there, my producer friend? We're coming up on 32 minutes right now. Wow, we're only coming up on 32 minutes. Wow. Well, let's. Uh, why don't you throw me out a potpourri here? Uh, we we talked about our Diana to get, and we talked about uh, talked about nine one one being a joke. Only it's a a cruel joke. Throw How, me a throw me a go ahead and throw me a potpourri. There's been a. Have you seen any stories about the um, not just gun companies but accessory companies as well that are not selling to law enforcement agencies and states and slave states? Yeah, actually, uh, there, there's there's a number. What's what's the? Uh, I, I was looking for the, you got the website? exact figure, but I can't I can't find it. Yeah, well, we know that last year this this kicked off, and it's kind of it hasn't been really in the news here lately because there was a big push for uh, when Colorado and New York and Connecticut uh, all decided to uh, push through the anti you know unconstitutional gun control bills in, in order an effort to disarm the citizens. We know that Wilson Combat got on that. We know that Magpul got on that. We knew. Uh, did you find it? Yeah, it's called thepoliceloophole.com. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, go to the the, the, the policeloophole.com. We got Barrett, Midway, Cheaper Than Dirt. <laughs> oh, go figure. Uh, who else is on here? That's Three Arms Company. Um, I'm not seeing any more large companies larue tactical they were one of the first yeah barrett and larue were one of the first and and that goes way back barrett when uh, the people's republic of california decided to ban the barrett 50 caliber or the 50 caliber ammunition from possession by peasants you peasants can't own it out there because it's just too dangerous spikes tactical our That's friends right. our friends over there at red jacket uh rock river rock river arms signed on yep, rock river arms cmmg <laughs> Wow, there's there's a lot of a lot there's a lot of big companies on here now. Well, that's a that's a a good uh, little tidbit for you guys there. If you want to find out who the people are, who the gun companies are that have put their necks on the line and have decided to support you, the citizen, over the state, go to is it thepoliceloophole dot com all one word put together? Yes. Okay. Go to the – and Jared obviously will put a link in the show notes for you guys, but thepoliceloophole.com, and you can find out who the companies are that are actually standing up for you. So uh, that's that's a, a good we, Benny. 
Our, our buddy Dustin, Element Arms is on there. Element Arms is on there? Cool. Yeah. Very cool. And and who else you said was Spikes was on there? CMMG's on, on there. there. Barrett's on there. Wilson Combat. Wilson Midwest Combat. Industries, Midwest. Magpul. Magpul. All right. Fantastic. So, and folks, we talked about this a little uh, pre- during a previous episode, but quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, if you have a state, uh, and when I say the state, I mean the government, if you have a government that decides that they're going to go ahead and and pass laws that apply to you, the peasant, but exempt themselves from those same laws, that is the foundation of tyranny, folks. And tyranny is not government in and of itself. Tyranny is the abuse of the citizens by the sitting government, okay? I found uh, 147 companies total. Oh, good. Excellent. So 147 companies total have jumped on board the police loophole.com or they've registered themselves with police loophole.com to let you know that if it is not lawful for the citizen to own it, then they're not going to sell to the state. And that goes particularly for like New York, Connecticut, uh, California, Colorado, uh, New Jersey. Who else has, has gone far off the reservation there? You've got a lot of them have gone far off the reservation. As far as uh, as far as guns are concerned, some of the things that we've done here recently. Oh, dude! Hey, uh, you guys see me out there? I'm going to show you something really cool. This is the new this is the new Benny of having the camera on. And for those of you that aren't listening or that aren't viewing this, uh, you're gonna you're gonna feel bad. You're like, man, quit showing stuff to the camera. What what he's showing is is very uh, is very neat in, in in more than one regard. Okay, what I just showed the camera for those of you that were viewing uh, at home was the DPMS uh, 260 Remington, a 260 Remington DPMS rifle that Jared actually. Uh, you want to tell them how you got well, that rifle? Yeah, I was going to ask if uh, if I could tell them. Yeah, um, tell them the story behind your rifle. That was actually uh, DPMS back when I was uh, fighting professionally. They were one of the first companies to. Sponsor me, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, sponsor. They were they sponsored uh, MMA fighters. Who was it? It was excess. I had excess. I had DPMS. Sites. I had Surefire. Um, I think those were the big three. Yeah, those were the big three. But uh, DPMS, they sent me the two sixty Remington rifle, and uh, do, did I shoot a pig with it over there at, at Bills? No, we didn't, you didn't get a chance. To shoot I didn't a pig get with a it. chance to shoot a pig with it, but uh, it's it's a it's a very nice rifle. And well, that, the, the reason we're mentioning it right now is not just because it's a nice rifle, but because it's even nicer now. Because what does it have on it? Duracoat. That's oh, right. speaking of Duracoat, I'm, I'm sad for two reasons. I, I broke my kettlebell last night, so I just <laughs> Duracoated it last week, and. But hey, the paint's still intact. Just the handle broke. That's right. That's right. The uh, the, the, the <laughs> so now I have a shot put. I have a forty pound shot put. Yeah, forty pound shot put. Let me know how that works out for you. If you can, if you can do a, use a forty pound shot put, my hat is off to you. But uh, uh, yeah, as you guys know that we've done, especially if you're not following us on social media or you know, if you hate fa- if you hate Facebook, great. A lot of people hate Facebook. I'm not really fans of Facebook. It, it's a necessary evil. But uh, if you follow us on our mobile app. On uh, Instagram, Twitter, what have you, we're all the time putting up pictures. And one of the pictures that we recently put up was a picture of Jared's new rifle that uh, we did in a Duracoat pattern. And if you guys aren't familiar with them yet, Duracoat, in addition to you know making lots of refinishing products for professionals, they have introduced the Duracoat uh, aerosolized cans. And I'm not going to give you all the specifics right now. You can go to Duracoat. It's it's actually Lauer, L A. U E R Lauer Custom C U S T O M Weaponry and you can spell weaponry dot com or just type in Duracoat aerosol can in your favorite search engine duck it but uh, you can Duracoat now at home in your own garage in your own shop and if you go to the Duracoat's website if you go to Lauer Custom Weaponry they've got all kinds of different kits they've got the the peel and spray kits and they have instructions and they you can go step by step, and you can do your very own camouflage patterns in your garage, in your workshop, what have you. You just need to have a little bit of patience, and don't expect your first project to be perfect, but have a little bit of patience, take a little bit of time to read the instructions, guys, and you can uh, do a Duracoat project of your very own. And the great news about that is 
it's a pretty modest investment. Uh, if you've ever looked into some of the other coating products, the Cerakote and, and all these different things, uh, often you have to, you know, box your guns up and ship them away. Uh, or you have to take them to a local guy and you have to leave them. And, you know, it could be uh, now the, there are good products out there and there are people that do a really, really good professional job. But often you're talking an investment of 150, 200, maybe even $300 to get your favorite gun recoded. Well, the Duracoat aerosol cans are in the, the low to mid thirties. So like for 32, 35 bucks, you have a can, uh, an aerosol can in one color. They each come in one color, but you can completely do a long gun with one can. Actually, you can do an entire, what we found is an entire long gun plus some accessories, knife handles or magazines or whatever you want to do. So uh, check that out. If you're, if you're in the market, you go to your gun safe and you look in there and you see your, you know, a hand-me-down shotgun that your uncle Phil gave you and, and the finish has seen better days or, uh, you're, you know, a 22 rifle that you've had since you were 16 years old and all the bluings worn off it now. And you thought, man, I'd really like to recoat that gun, but I, I just can't bring myself to spend $200 on a new finish for a 22 rifle. And, and how many people can. So you can do it yourself for 30, 35 bucks. So check them out. Check out the Durasol or Durasol. Duracoat, easy for me to say, aerosol cans. Now, folks, we want to thank you for being with us for this segment of Student of the Gun Radio. We, as always, we appreciate you guys being out there. We appreciate you taking a moment out of your busy schedules, if you're an iTunes listener, to go ahead and post and leave a comment. Uh, if you want to, go ahead and download the Student of the Gun mobile app on your iPhone, on your iPad, on your Android phone. Go to the Google Play Store, type in Student of the Gun. It's there. It's free. Uh, if you're an iTunes kind of person, go to the iTunes Store, type in Student of the Gun. Bingo. You got the mobile app. You can put it on your iPad, your iPhone, what have you. And the reason it's free, Jared, why is the mobile app free for them to download? The mobile app is free because of our good friends, that, <clears throat> friends at Century Arms. Um, they took the confidence in us that they have, and they put it in monetary form and paid for the app for you guys. So, yeah, so we could develop that app because, as you know, uh, nothing that is done on a computer or it, it, things don't do themselves for free. And speaking of Century Arms, that is a good segue into what? If you have not signed up for the Student of the Gun newsletter yet, shame on you. Because in addition to all the good stuff that we've already talked about, the one-box workout free report, the exclusive videos that you get to view as a member, in addition to all that, we can't stop giving stuff away. And we partnered with our good friends at Century Arms and at Frog Lube, and we're going to do another giveaway. We're going to give away a C39 100% made in the USA AK rifle. A range pack, that's right, we're not just going to give you a gun, we're going to give you ammo to go with it. A 180-round range pack from the Red Army uh, line of ammo, that's again from Century. And then eventually you're going to want to clean and lubricate this thing. Actually, what you should do is when you, as soon as you get the gun, as soon as the winner, as soon as you get the gun, strip that gun down, spray it down with the frog, frog lube solvent, wipe it off, then put green frog lube on it, reassemble it, and get out to the range and run that sucker. So you're going to get a C39 made in the USA AK, ammo to go with it, and a frog tube all-in-one cleaning kit. How cool is that? It's pretty cool. And all you have to do is go to studentofthegun.com, go over there to the, the – let me see. It's on the right-hand side now, Jared, right? Yeah, go over to the right-hand side and fill it out, put your name, your uh, your email address, send it. And then don't forget to do what? What does everybody forget to do? Or not everybody, but some people forget to do this. They put their name, they put their email address, they click it, and they send it away, and they're like, hey, how come I never got the newsletter? Because what didn't they do? You have to confirm it. We send you a confirmation email because uh, we don't want to send stuff to people that don't want it. So we make sure that there's an opt-in option, too, actually. Yeah, you actually have to go – you have to confirm it. Now, some people's uh, emails are set differently, and it might go to your spam filter. If you've got Gmail, it might go to your promotions filter or promotions folder. So uh, just make sure that you confirm that. Once you confirm it, then you're good to go. You'll get all your free stuff. You'll get your free uh, your free report and all that jazz. So, folks, it's time to put the uh, put the cork back in Student of the Gun segment one here. Now, remember, you're a beginner once, but you should indeed be a student for life. Mm -hmm. 